we take some time to prepare ourselves for our time of worship. Father, we gather as people on a journey. Uh, we believe, we have doubts, we do good, we sin. We are imperfect humans, uh, still deeply loved by you. And so, Father, we acknowledge love and grace. We acknowledge hope and faith. Because these are the essence uh, of who you are. We seek forgiveness and grace from you and from those that we've harmed. Uh, assured of that grace, we are ready to go out and grow. We yearn for a new way, a new perspective, a clear path. Uh, though we are full of trust and full of doubt, uh, we turn to you. Uh, Father, we are here today. And so we ask that you will speak to us, that you will continue creating us, that you will inspire our hearts, our minds, that you will guide our actions. And so, Almighty God, we celebrate that where your people are gathered uh, together in love, you are present, and good things happen and life is full. We celebrate that we are immersed in your mystery, that our lives are always more than they seem. Father, we belong to each other. We belong to a universe of great creative energy whose source and destiny is you, our God. And so we celebrate. Celebrate that your spirit beat in the heart of Jesus of Nazareth, the good news of your healing, embracing, and liber liberating love, was heard by the broken and the lonely, and all bound by life's sorrows and struggles. We celebrate that the spirit of peace and hope is present with us and through us and in our struggle to love. Uh, you come and embolden us so that something of your holy presence may be known in this world. And so, Father, you are aware of the hurts and the longings that each one of us carry you are aware of the awe and the wonder that is uh, offered to us. Uh, we want to be aware of the gifts of faith and the community of faith and the gift that it is to us. And so, Father, in this moment in time, we simply pause. We become aware of the sacredness of our lives, the sacredness of the life of those who sit next to us and behind us and in front of us. We become aware of the sacredness of all life. And so, Father, as we are aware uh, that the life that we live is God-breathed, uh, we commit ourselves to you. And so in our acting, in our speaking, in our living, may we know you always. Amen. Amen. Well, a very, very warm welcome to uh, all of you. Um, it is a Alberton rain-soaked Sunday, uh, but wonderful uh, to have the rain uh, with us over the weekend after such a dry march. Um, and so we give thanks to God uh, for the rain that has been upon us. We also into a new season of uh, the church as we celebrate uh, a risen Christ. And so there will be a change of pace, um, a change of focus. And so from um, this Sunday going through to Pentecost, uh, we'll have a look at um, everything to do with being a church, being the people of God. Uh, and so we start uh, that today. 
And so uh, I trust that the journey over the next seven weeks uh, will be a good one as we uh, seek to be the church that God wants us to be. Hey, operators, let's get to the flower ministry. Um, first of all, from Karen Andres Lundy, uh, happy birthday in heaven, Ralph Stale. Uh, your life on earth was short, but we will never ever forget you. And then also, um, uh, Ian uh, to Jean, wishing happy birthday on the 10th to our amazing Jean, wife, mom, granny, friend, always there for everyone. Uh, also so blessed with our twins who turned seven on the 11th. And so uh, much to celebrate um, within a family. And so those are the flower messages uh, for today. Um, Verna has been on leave for the week. Um, we thought that we could uh, handle all things administrative. Uh, I sent out an email and it came back to me. I said, but I didn't send it to me. I sent it to the leaders. Uh, so I don't know why. But uh, that will be sorted out on Monday. Um, also, uh, there might have been a glitch or two. Uh, some people received both, um, uh, with the newsletter, received uh, both attachments. Um, others uh, only received the financials uh, from the ASM. Um, so I'm not too sure uh, what happened there, but Vern is here on Monday. Um, <laughs> and so there's help on the way. Um, and it will be good to have her back in the office. Uh, we miss having a brain in the office. Um, all right. As I said a little earlier, the post-Easter sermon series is all about being a church, um, and uh, we start that off today, uh, and we started off a little differently to other Sundays. We are going to take opportunity just to reflect back on our journey through Lent, um, and to maybe just uh, celebrate or note um, how we are the church. Uh, currently, um, and how we can encourage uh, ourselves to continue uh, as the people of God going forward. But um, uh, there are a number of movements within the Christian movement, um, and some of them are uh, poles apart from each other. And so there are many people whose experience of the church uh, is quite consumerist, and so you come and you almost shop. You get something that you want or need uh, from church. Uh, and church offers you a whole lot of things. And uh, if you can't find what you're looking for, we'll, uh, we will uh, rework things and we will give you what you're looking for. Um, and so there's almost like a consumerist mentality. Uh, come and get um, your bargain uh, at church. Um, on the other side, there are people, the Quakers in particular, uh, who have a very, very contemplative worship, always just reflecting and thinking and sensing God's movement. And so they all gather on, uh, for a time of worship. And the instruction is that if you can better the silence, uh, say something. Uh, and very often uh, things are quiet. But uh, silence uh, is the act of worship within the Quaker movement. And so I'm hoping that we, somewhere in the middle there, that we um, are um, active and that we uh, are moving and that things are being said and uh, ministry is happening through the proclamation of the word. Um, but I'm also hoping that we are taking some of it in, that we're slowing ourselves down, um, that we're not 
uh, growing fat on um, everything that we're taking in from the church uh, and not exercising it. And so today gives us opportunity just to slow down and uh, to reflect on our journey over the last seven weeks. But a little on being the church just to start us off. Uh, in our gospel reading, I'm going to be reading from John chapter 20. Um, it is one of the post-resurrection um, accounts. It's the text that is set for the day in the lectionary. Um, I'm just going to read uh, from verse 19 through to 23. But listen for what it means to be church. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The Lord will always bless the hearing of his word. That passage goes on to speak about his next appearance because Thomas wasn't amongst the disciples at this one. Um, and uh, it's the account of him appearing when Thomas is present and in engagement with Thomas. But in this reading, uh, and just the portion that we read, we hear of the first coming together of the disciples. This is the first church moment after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so circumstances have unsettled them. They fear personal repercussions resulting from their following of Jesus. But in gathering, we hear of the presence of the risen Christ. As they gather, we hear of them being filled with joy and with peace. We hear of forgiveness being something that needs to be part of their journey. We hear of the Holy Spirit being at work. We hear Jesus telling his disciples that as he was sent by the Father, so he is sending his disciples. And if we go into the rest of the New Testament, we will see how this sending happens. If we go, for example, into the beginning uh, of the first letter of John, uh, we will hear uh, from those living Jesus' instruction on being sent as he was sent by the Father, uh, of them being given uh, to the world as a love offering, uh, of there just being a participation in the life of Jesus always. And so as we mentioned during Holy Week that we are taken by God, that we're blessed by God, that we're broken by this world, but we are given uh, to this world. Um, these people go out. Uh, they are given as a love offering uh, to the world. And we find them witnessing to their experience. And their experience is this, that this infinite God was amongst them. The incarnate God was in their midst so that those being told about that experience can experience the joy that is found in the closeness or the presence or the communion with this infinite God. And so what they witnessed or experienced, they pass on. They witness to a God of light who addresses darkness 
And so you can go and read the opening of 1 John uh, and just familiarize yourself with them being sent um, as Jesus was sent. And so these scriptures are before us as we delve into what it means to be the church or to be the people of God. Uh, they are scriptures that give us clues. Um, whenever we need to consider who we are as God's people, as the church, uh, we can go to scripture and consider what it meant to be church for these people. And so the four questions that we can ask ourselves as a result of these scriptures are the following. Can our gathering on Sunday, on the first day of the week, can our gathering be a place where people who have been unsettled by circumstance or people who are uh, unsettled because of personal threat can have opportunity to gather and meet the risen Christ. That's what the church was all about. A whole lot of people unsettled by circumstance gathering to meet the risen Christ. Can we be that place? In our times of being unsettled, can we say, come, come and meet the risen Christ? In moments when other people have been unsettled by circumstance, can we welcome them into this place and pray for them to know the risen Christ in our gathering? Can we be that kind of a church? Secondly, can our gatherings be characterized by joy and by peace and forgiveness? So simple, yet so elusive. Just to make sure that the moment of gathering is joyous and peaceful and plenty of room for grace so that if there is any kind of offense, if there's been an oversight, if there's been um, an um, uncalled for word, that we can just forgive. Can we be a place which is characterized by joy and peace and forgiveness? Thirdly, can the Holy Spirit be received by us in our times of gathering? Can we come here not for any other reason but to receive a ministry from the Holy Spirit? Can the Holy Spirit be breathed into us as the people of God as we gather? And lastly, can we be instructed to be sent from this place just as the Father sent Jesus? To know that this time is a time of instruction to be sent into the world as Jesus was sent into the world by the Father. And so being sent after we've gathered, can we be that kind of a church? And so today we want to set aside some time for the people of God just to share or to witness to their experience of their time of worship during Lent. To share their experience of God at work in them. To share their experience of gathering as people who are unsettled by circumstance but receive peace and joy and forgiveness in their meeting through God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That as they have been the people of God, 
they've discovered the God of light who addresses all darkness. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for us to simply to receive the testimonies of people who witness to the work of God uh, in their lives. Uh, and may it just be the beginning of our journey uh, as we consider what it means to be God's church here and now in 2024. May God bless us as we begin this journey. Amen. Let's pray. So, Father, we uh, want to thank you for uh, the past seven weeks, our journey through Lent, our journey to prepare ourselves to receive um, Christ crucified but Christ resurrected. And so, Father, as we start considering the a life that is found uh, in a crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ, we want to ask for your rich blessing uh, upon each one of us as we commit uh, to being your a light in this world, a light that is to shine in every a form of darkness. And so, Father, as we uh, hear testimonies, as we um, share um, or listen to these testimonies and uh, uh, as they resonate with our own story, we ask for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And so bless us in this time, we pray. Amen. Amen. And so I'm going to ask Sandy forward just to uh, share a little of her journey uh, with us. Uh, for the past few weeks, we have followed some of the miracles of Jesus. It was one of these miracles that I believe led to my healing. Um, some time back, I became extremely ill with severe headaches, vomiting, and diarrhea. The doctors were at a loss as to the cause. One morning, I was so violently ill that Linda rushed me to hospital where the doctors told her that she should call the family together as he was sure I would not see the morning. But Jesus had other plans for me. Linda decided to take me to a homeopath where I was diagnosed with leaky gut syndrome caused by an excessive intake of sugar and antibiotics. Anything I ate or drank would pass through my gut and into my blood, causing huge infections and toxins. We were worshipping at Alberton Methodist at the time, and Reverend John Stack was preaching about the bleeding woman. When in a state of shame, I realized that I had never once included Jesus in my illness. I called upon him to please restore me to health, as I couldn't see a way forward anymore. I was living with this condition for seven years. Right there in my seat, I met with Jesus. The verse, be still and know that I am God, hit me so hard because of the utter silence that I experienced. That silence was a moment that I can't explain. I was alone with Jesus. Then the heat started in my feet and worked its way up. My stomach was on fire. My hands were sweating, yet they were dry. My head was burning. And as quickly as it started, the moment was over. I was healed in such a flash that I thought I might have imagined it all. But I knew that my Jesus had met me there. Even as years passed, I still praise Jesus for his mighty hand on my life and a memory that will last for me for eternity. So I just praise Jesus 
for my healing. He is a great God. And so the church is about a people who are unsettled by circumstance and personal threat, meeting the risen Christ. It's about knowing of joy and peace and forgiveness after meeting with Christ. It's about receiving the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to work within us as we gather. It's about receiving instruction to be sent into the world, just as the Father sent Jesus into the world. I'm going to ask uh, Dot to come and share a little with us. I find Gavin's weekly pastoral message very inspirational. In week nine, he spoke of the shack. It's a movie I've seen and I've read the book. In week 10, he spoke of mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. I googled and to my surprise found similarity in the quote in the Alpha course. More about that just now. During Holy Week, we were reminded that we are God's creation and most importantly, that we are unique. He sees us in his stories. He gives us a voice. We are complicated. Sometimes we see ourselves in other stories. Trevor Hudson, a Methodist minister, a well-known author, writes, sitting next to you in church is a pool of tears. Our pools are different. Sometimes they are deeper. Sometimes they are muddier. Sometimes they've been caused and done and been done to us by others, and sometimes as a result of our own doing. In his book, The Serenity Prayer, he tells us, befriend your tears, share your pain, and express your anger. This brings me to my story. I was an only child, and at the age of eight, I went to boarding school at a convent in Kimberley. When growing up, I often spoke to God about how I would love to have had a brother or a sister. Many years later, I found out that my parents were in fact divorced. My dad just never left home. They seemed happy. Then in September of 1962, in my matricule, I was given the news that I had a brother. I was already 17. My dad had remarried. Thirteen years later, Stevie came to stay with Dave and I, and we became his legal guardians. He went to church with me for five years, later was baptized and confirmed in that little hall over there. Two years after that, he was to do his military training. On a weekend pass, he had a motorbike accident. And three days later, he went into a coma. On this very day, I was on my way to see a client when I called out, Lord God, I give my life to you. I could not believe that this was me speaking. I'd known God all my life. After all, I was in a convent. At the age of 20, he went to be with his heavenly father. He always said that God had something special for him to do. And he wasn't wrong. God not only answered my prayers by giving me a brother, Stevie was like my son, and he was my friend. His mom had a drinking problem and had given him up at the age of 10 months. He met her in his matricule. Three months later, she had a relapse. But during those three months, he had captured her heart. Getting back to the movie, The Shack. What it meant to me in this movie, the person playing the part of the Holy Spirit collected tears in a bottle. I saw them as healing tears. Gavin, in his pastoral letter, speaks of how 
We see God during difficult times, trials, and suffering. Mere Christianity, an assessment of who we are. In 1992, Dave was retrenched and was without work for some 18 months. God answers prayers in his way and in his time. Sometimes that can be quite scary because it's not always the way we expect it. In March of 1994, just before the elections in our country and rumors of civil war, God was telling me to leave my job. I would be giving up a bond of 2%, a company, car, medical aid, and the perks that go with 17 years service. But by the end of 1994, we owned a fully operational business. Five years after Dave passed on, I thought it was time for changes. Having worked 57 years, turning 75 then, I retired, closed the business, and sold my house. I was not entirely happy, but God had given me his blessing. Shortly afterwards, the COVID epidemic arrived, and our lives changed. I lived in a huge complex, but I was very much alone. Like many others, I began experiencing anxiety attacks. My house was extremely cold, my back went into a spasm, and as much as my GP did not see the need for me to go to x-rays or blood tests, I insisted only to discover that I had a degenerative back and rheumatoid arthritis. I was angry with God. I looked for all sorts of reasons for these anxiety attacks. I blamed my marriage, I blamed my jobs, I blamed my church. I had no one else to talk to, so I spoke to God unceasingly about anything and everything, and I cried. I cried out to him a lot. As Albert, um, Albert Einstein, in his book, God vs. Science, puts it, there's no such thing as darkness. It's merely the absence of light. And evil is simply the absence of God. I then began to remember the good days in my marriage, far outweighed the bad. Fresh beginnings in my church. And with the help of God, one day I'll understand how things can seem so wrong in the house of God. This year, 2024, has been good. I've joined a Bible study. I'm embarrassed to admit that, although I did read the Bible, now I have a leader, she's not here, and who has helped me at my age to study the Bible. Angus Buckham was right, or is right, when he answers, when he says, many of our answers on our daily problems are in God's word. Angus Buckham was right. Oh, sorry. After about 15 years ago, I was writing a book of many testimonies, which I sent to Angus Buchan, and I had mentioned his name in it. And to my astonishment, he phoned me and he suggested I write another. Neither have been published. I will leave them in God's hands. Perhaps I was just meant to put pen to paper for my personal healing. God bless. It's a wonderful gift in receiving uh, the story of another. And the gift is, is that their story enlargens your story. Is that as people speak, there's a resonance. Uh, you, that explains something of what I went through. Or I can relate to something that said, or I've never ever thought of things in this way. And so it's a wonderful gift. And maybe as you have listened to uh, the story of Scripture, as you have listened to Sandy's story, as you've listened to Dot's story, uh, maybe you found that work happening in you even now, that there's this enlargening of your being happening. Um, I'm going to give opportunity for you to maybe uh, share some of your appreciation. Um, as you've listened. But before I do that, I just want to uh, add a little of my story over this Lenten period. I think there have been um, three moments where um, I've sensed um, God saying, Gavin, this is kind of important. Um, this is something... Um, 
that I offer you uh, for your good, uh, for your sake. Uh, the first was right at the beginning of a Lent. Um, I shared a little around making space for God to be God. Uh, we don't need to understand, we don't need to explain, uh, we don't need to micromanage, uh, we just allow God to be God. And uh, it took me back to a, a moment um, that I shared with uh, my then bishop, um, Reverend Jonathan Anderson. Um, and it was just about managing or coping or dealing um, with the brokenness within the church, uh, the brokenness within society. And it just, it has, it, it was overwhelming for me. And I knew that if anybody uh, was exposed to the brokenness of the church and the world, um, it was Jonathan. And so we were chatting. And he said to me, Gavin, it's quite simple. Every morning I wake up in the morning and I say to God, God, um, I know that you're going to surprise me uh, today. And I'm saying, but Jonathan, that's just such a bad prayer. Um, how can you just open yourself up to be surprised by God? Um, don't you want to be surprised in a good way by God? And he says, no. He's just going to open himself up to be surprised by God, whether it be good, whether it be bad, whether it be light, whether it be heavy. Um, he's just open uh, for him to live and to let God be God in his day. And so that was the challenge that was given to me many, many years ago, is can I make space for God to be God? Uh, not to um, try and manage my life, um, but just to allow uh, the things that happen in this world to happen uh, and to let God do what God does with the things of this world. And so that was a message uh, that I gave at the beginning of Lent and the first hearer of that message was me. Um, and so I knew that I needed to make space for God to be God during this Lenten journey. It wasn't uh, long after that, I think it was the day after we began on Ash Wednesday. On that Thursday we had a circuit a staff meeting um, and we were led uh, in that meeting by our superintendent and Reverend Franz Mabuza um, asked for us to do some soul searching and some introspection um, and to share a little around um, who we are to do battle with. Uh, in our desert experience, in our 40 days, um, as Jesus uh, battled with certain realities, what are the realities that we're going to be battling with uh, during our Lenten period? And again, it was a surprise. Uh, it was God saying, Gavin, so what are your realities that you battle with? Um, I hadn't intended that to be part of my journey, um, but uh, it came to me uh, through a godly man, and I needed to answer the question, what do I battle with? What is the reality that I do battle with in my 40 days in a desert? And I realized that uh, one of the realities that I battle most with in my life uh, is to accept the fact that I age, uh, that I grow old, uh, that I'm uh, daily uh, getting closer to my dying. Uh, it's just something that I don't like, uh, and it's been that way forever. Uh, if I could have stayed at school for longer than 12 years, I know I tried, um, I would have. If I could stay at varsity for uh, longer than money allowed me, I would have. Um, and so there's almost a, a Peter Pan complex. I just don't want to age. I want to stay young. Um, and in many ways, 
uh, maybe feel um, unsettled by growing old, uh, having to give up uh, certain things, uh, to give up youthfulness. Uh, and so the day that uh, my ribs were broken for the third time in a fight with my son, um, and I realized that I need to stop fighting with my son um, because my body can't keep up with the fight, um, it was a difficult day um, because it was a wonderful way in which to engage and to rough and tumble and to just be light with one another uh, and show him who's boss. Um, but the day came when uh, that needed to change. Uh, and so there's uh, some kind of mourning in having to give those things up. Um, and, you know, those are simple things, but uh, over and over again, um, I've really uh, battled and protested uh, with aging. Uh, growing old is not something I sit comfortably with. And so, once again, I spoke lots about uh, Jesus uh, being a day closer to his death. Uh, Jesus uh, being exposed, and that's what age does, it exposes you to a bigger world. And when you get exposed to a bigger world, you get exposed to the sin and the suffering and the evil uh, that is in the world. Um, and so, that journey... Um, kind of challenges me and says, Gavin, you need to grow up because these are the realities um, and I sense uh, God uh, saying uh, your pace is slow but I'm patient uh, but you need to grow up. And so that was the uh, second thing that happened uh, in the first week of Lent. Uh, another significant moment came when I was able to have a Sunday where I wasn't preaching, uh, Taryn was preaching, and uh, I was able to go and sit in the congregation and receive ministry from Taryn. And she was speaking about uh, Jesus navigating your boat and offering guidance. Uh, and it was the story of the disciples who had gone across uh, the Galilee Lake um, and a storm had blown up uh, and they were consumed by that storm um, and yet uh, Jesus was found in the midst of that storm as he approached them and got them through that storm. And so there was this message that Jesus can guide you through the storms of life. And the one thing that struck me, and now I'm speaking about the storm or I'm speaking about my battle with reality in the desert, uh, what is the storm? What is the thing that takes my focus uh, that I become uh, agitated, unsettled about? Uh, this whole thing of growing old or, or, or aging. Um, it sometimes disturbs me, leaves me unsettled. And then Terence says, the storm isn't resolved out of your focus on the storm. And so to analyze the storm and to get data on the storm and to figure out how the storm's moving and uh, what the options are for me to negotiate getting out of the storm, um, she says, that's your second best option. There's a better option than that. Your storm is not resolved out of your focus on it, but by your willingness to allow Jesus into your boat. Focus on Jesus. Don't focus on the storm. And there's this invitation. that whatever the storms that Jesus faced in his life, whatever the suffering, even in his dying, um, focus on God. 
uh, and my Easter message is given to me. And so that was my Easter journey. And I thank God for it. Uh, and I thank God for the lessons uh, that he provides um, through the church that minister to me. And so before I invite the um, worship team up to continue to minister to us, um, I'm just going to ask if there is anybody who wants to share something. Um, any of your journey? Uh, anything come to mind as you have been listening uh, to the scriptures today, uh, to uh, the testimony of Sandy and Dot and myself? Uh, if so, uh, won't you come forward and just share something of that? I think most people here know me. The people who don't, you're missing out. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a walking miracle. A lot of people know that. Um, in 2016, I was diagnosed with melanoma in my arm. And I had an operation. They took it out. And 2017, it was back again. It must have liked me. So I went and had another operation. 2018, I was clear. Yay. Hallelujah. That was in March, but in September, there was a different story. It had mastitized and gone into my lung and into my liver. And I said to the oncologist, so now what? So she said, there's nothing we can do for you. Mel um, chemo doesn't work on melanoma. Mike started screaming like a banshee. I put my head down on my arm on the table and I said, Lord, he's never going to manage on his own. You've got to help us. So the oncologist looked at me and she said, just hold on, I'm going to go speak to somebody. So she went to speak to Dr. Rappaport at um, Rosebank. And she came back and she said that there's a new trials out and... Um, you can go and see him and see what he says. So that was in the September. I had six weeks of trials, and in the November, he said, you can go on the trials. Now, I was 75. I was like, okay, well, this is fantastic. So I went every three weeks. I went and they gave me immunoboost. And every nine weeks, I had to go for checkups, CT scans, MRIs, blood tests, you name it. So, and that was in 2019, I started that. And then, no, it was in, yeah, 2019. And then in 2020, Mike passed away and my world just fell apart. I didn't want to carry on with the treatment. I was just too upset. And my daughter said, what about me? You can't just pack up and go. You can't just not do anything. So I carried on with the trials. And, and in, I did it for two years. And then another two years with checkups and everything. And last year in June, they rang me and they said, you are completely clear. There is no cancer in your body at all. The immuno is not like chemo. It does not make you ill. It boosts your body. And that's why at 80, nearly 81, I look like this and I am able to clean my house and look after everything because God worked a miracle in my life and the Holy Spirit is now moving on my head and I am, yeah, um, just praise God because miracles do happen.
Thank you, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Yep. Um, I have two parts to my testimony. Um, the first one was is re in relation to the lens period, what happened to me personally during this period, and then the other one is what happened earlier on in my life. Um, this one, the latest one, um, on Easter Sunday, when we, re we read the scripture about the um, resurrection of Jesus, uh, we read that um, women prepared, uh, prepared the, the stents and whatever that they, perfume and that they needed to do um, to, to, to the body of Jesus. And when they got there, they didn't find him. But what, whilst they were still wondering what was happening, then suddenly there were two men, uh, angels, in the form of, uh, angels in the form of men, and they asked them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because they were looking for Jesus. They were wondering where Jesus was. And then that was, the, that was their question to them. And then those words, as much as I had been, have heard them many times before, because based on my background, I grew up in a church environment, um, Monday to Sunday, is, was church, is been church for me all along. And so church for me has been, it doesn't, let me just put it this way, it doesn't disturb my way of living. It's more like the way I, I live. And so I find it's normal to gel with it whenever I'm in the church environment or something like that. And now I've heard all these stories about Jesus and all that all these years. Some of it has become, I wouldn't say numb, but been so familiar in my head that it didn't have those uh, such kind of impact. But this Easter's, when those words were read, then the, uh, the preacher, uh, Reverend Gavin, explained further from, uh, on those words. And then he said, we look for Jesus also everywhere else. We can find him also in the, in the in the Bible when we read the word. As Dot said when, he, when she was testi uh, testifying now, saying that uh, the answers to our lives and everything, we find them there in the Bible. I knew that. I've been attending um, Bible studies. I have a couple of, um, call them a Bible reading plans in the house, trying to, to be more active in reading the Bible, but at times it's a struggle. It is. But somehow we, we do it. But that day, when I heard those words saying, you can find Jesus there as well, then it, it stood out and spoke to me personally. Say, this message now, it's speaking to me personally. And it was answering that question when, of me struggling with a, reading the Bible the way I would like to read it and find out those answers. But that day, I said, oh, that message was for me. I took that one home. And then the other part is about um, uh, my health. Uh, now in April, last year, I would say now it's a year uh, since I was last hospitalized. I remember beginning of January last year, I was hospitalized um, with pneumonia. And I remember when in January the 3rd or something like that. I went there, and then when I was there, I went, it was on a Monday, I got there, and then I got familiar with the nurses and the staff around, and they said, oh, your doctor, uh, normally uh, on Thursday, he, re he re discharges uh, his patients. And so if you, are not, um, if you are not amongst those, they know that you are going for the other week. Well, I was hoping that I would go in the first week, because I was, they came, the doctor said, okay, it's fine, okay, we can see. I think we'd go on, on, before the end of the week, we'd go home. And I was like, oh, okay, then I would be amongst those. Came Thursday, Friday, nothing. Then I stayed. Then uh, he was working with a, a lung specialist, because uh, he's a physician, and there's a lung specialist who came every day to check this and this. And then on day number uh, 10, 
then he came and said, you know what, Mr. Lamini, we didn't release you earlier with the first batch of people that normally leave before the end of the weekend. And the reason is, when we assess your situation, normally um, the condition of people in that situation, around day seven or eight, we are ready to take them to theater, not theater, uh, to ICU, because this program that we put you in, which is about 11 days, we put you in that program, but a uh, stats tells us that on this day, day seven, eight, nine, then that's when uh, our patients, their situation goes, ju just goes down and they have to be taken into a theater. And his words that he used in the end, because he started with those words and then he explained and then he ended with his words. He said, Mr. Lamini, you dodged a bullet. What I said, okay. It didn't mean much to me, but I, 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 I went on. As I was at home and I tell, I'm telling my wife, after being discharged, the doctor said this, but it didn't mean much. Then I realized, no, what he meant was, um, on that day, after day seven, if things turned out the way they expected, then they were waiting to take me there. Then after that, I would stay another week to recover out of um, ICU, then they would release me. And I said, well, I didn't think that way, and it was a miracle for me. I was, all I said was, thank God you were with me. All, and what I had when I was in hospital, I had this Bible, re, uh, Bible reading plan. I was reading and what would happen in the morning would be around four or five, uh, the nurses would come and wake us all us up in the ward, make us take meds and then they leave. And then we have to go up and a shower and do all those things. So I would normally do that. After they've left, I would go be the first one to go shower. And then after that, what else to do? Then I start to either read the Bible or the business book that I had with me. Then when everything had happened, I, it, I only realized it when I was home that, yes, he said I touched the bullets, but I don't think it was him who saved me. There is only one who made me be like this today. And so for that, I say amen. the Lord mighty God bless and keep you forever give you peace perfect peace strength for every endeavor lift your eyes Seek His face, fear.